Is that understandable so far? Why is this important? Go back and ask, the first step is this. What does this do? What does it do? It controls a typical behavior in response to the signal. Well, what is this called? Well, it represents awareness of the environment through physical sensation. So what is this control unit actually called? Perception. Perception, awareness of the environment through physical sensation. So if I go back a second, I say, what is the function of this? And the answer is this. It's perception. It sees the environment and activates a behavior. There's no DNA involved. There's no genes involved. All we're talking about is stimulus response. Stimulus comes in the receptor, response made by the effector. Okay? So the point about it is this simple first conclusion. It's very basic. Behavior, which is movement. This is behavior. <laughs> movement of protein is controlled by the signal, but via perception. So the bottom line is this. Perception controls behavior. If there is no perception, there's no behavior. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, well, that's number one. We didn't have genes involved yet. So let's just see how this actually works. So basically, here are proteins in the cell. Let's say that these proteins carry out a specific function, respiration or digestion. We call it a pathway. So let's say it's a muscle contraction. That these proteins, when activated, what, will, what activates the protein? The signal activates the protein. So what we're going to do is convert an environmental signal using the receptor and the effector. And this time I'm using an enzyme. Okay? And what I'm going to show you is how the mechanism from the environment, the signal, well, here's my connector one. Remember the green guy? But now the signal comes. And when the signal from the environment binds to the receptor, it changes the shape or confirmation of the receptor, which implies that the signal is there. So the protein informs the cell that something has happened. Now that that shape has changed, this processor protein, the green one, can bind to the shape because it wasn't able to bind before. It wasn't the right shape. It's like dominoes, one hitting the next. Now that the processor protein is bound to the receptor, it changes its shape and will conform to fit the, en the enzyme. So one domino hits the next, hits the next. Now that this is connected, I activate the enzyme, and the enzyme is going to create a signal. Now, here's, here's the connection between my muscle of the proteins and the receptor. This is the secondary signal. Remember, primary signal and secondary signal. Well, at first, it's bound and covered up and inhibited because if there's no signal, I don't want it to do anything. But when the signal shows up, then I take the enzyme, split it, and the active component, now this is the active signal, can bind to the protein. And now I can activate this protein. And this is the behavior that's going to be expressed by the cell. And the question, of course, is, well, what really activated this protein? What was the original source? The answer is the primary signal at the environment was then relayed by the secondary signal to activate the behavior of the cell. So without all the labels, if we just quickly look at it, uh, let's just go right through it real fast. And the point about it is this. Uh, let's see. That uh, here's the environmental signal. Here's the, the receptor, the effector. That's the perception unit. Perception is now being started because it saw the environment, changed the shape, activates the enzyme. The enzyme is activated, breaks that molecule, the signal molecule. The signal molecule comes down, binds to the protein, and generates behavior. The bottom line was this. The behavior of the cell is not programmed. The behavior of the cell is continuously adjusting to whatever the signals are in the environment. So now I got another question to ask you. What happens if that environmental signal shows up, but I don't have the proteins necessary in the cell right now for that event? So when it shows up, it says, oh, I can't make a response. I don't have the behavioral proteins. Where do we get the behavioral proteins? Now we bring the DNA back in. What's the role of the DNA? The DNA double helix actually is a blueprint of the protein. If I separate the helix into, each, into two separate strands, and you look at the, these, these are called bases. These are the steps of the double helix right here. The color sequence in the DNA codes for the sequence of the amino acids. So for every three bases, I can tell you which is the next amino acid. So the point is this. The plan of how to make a protein, a specific protein, is built into this DNA. So that every three bases say, oh, put in tryptamine. OK, put in proline. 
Next one, put in alanine, whatever it is. So the sequence, the DNA is a blueprint for the protein. Okay? That's all it is. It doesn't have any action except when I need it. So how do I activate the gene? Well, this is, you heard of cancer genes? And you say, what well, is that, a gene that gives you cancer? And the answer is, here's a simple truth. Genes do not self-activate. That's biochemically a truth, meaning a gene cannot turn itself on and a gene cannot turn itself off. If you want a gene to be active, it's not up to the gene. So the concept that there's a cancer gene is a false concept, meaning this. If the gene really caused cancer and you were in possession of that gene, when would you express the cancer? You would express it by the time you were born. Because as soon as the cells started to divide, the cancer gene would say, okay, time to make cancer. So how can you have so-called cancer gene for 30 or 40 years sitting in your body and you don't have cancer and then you get cancer? Should I go back and say the gene caused that? And the answer is no. In this paper by Niehaut, Metaphors in the Role of Genes in Development, he, play, he played it out in this true, truth, a simple statement of truth that I'm going to show you because I want to use his paper because the statement is so perfect. But the fact is this, what did he say? He said this, for 50 years, we have believed that genes are in control. We've been repeating it and saying it over and over again for 50 years so that it's part of every textbook. And the bottom line was, that was never a scientific reality. It was never scientifically established that genes control anything. It's not true. What is the truth? Well, the answer is this. The first thing, conventional belief, genes control biology, is totally false. Why? Genes can't turn themselves on. Genes can't turn themselves off. How are they going to control anything? They can't control themselves. So bottom line is the genes aren't in charge. So the question is, if I need a gene to be activated, what would, why would a gene be activated? To make the proteins for the cell that needs to do the behavior. So the truth statement is this. When a gene product is needed, a signal from its environment, not an emergent property of the gene itself, activates expression of the gene. Well, that's somewhat of a complicated sentence, so let's simplify it. Just read line two and line four. And if we read that, it says, a signal from its environment activates expression of the gene. What does that mean? The genes in your body are selected not because they're self-selecting. The genes are always selected in response to the environment that you're in. So if you had that cancer gene and for 35 years, let's say, you stood around saying, hey, I don't have cancer, and all of a sudden cancer happened, are we going to go to the gene and blame the gene? Or what would we actually look for as responsible if you understand the true statement? The signal from the environment. What change in your life? promoted activation of the gene that was sitting dormant for 35 years. Ah, we've been focusing on the gene all the time. The point is we have to start focusing on the signals. The signals do this. Well, let me explain how this happens. 